All right, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, we have two speakers who are gonna be talking about uh, one topic. It's gonna be a, a topic that ESNet has been working on for a couple of years now, uh, which is a, a program called the Data Mobility Exhibition. And we're gonna be talking about this sort of an, under two guises. First, uh, the steps that we've taken to sort of put some testing frameworks in place. And then uh, second speaker, George Robb is gonna be giving a, a demonstration but uh, we're gonna kick it off with Ken Miller giving the, the first part of this talk. So Ken, if you're ready, you can get going. All right, hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> just gonna kind of step into this, what we're looking to do to verify data transfers across our research and education infrastructures. Um, a lot of times we do a lot of personal testing. We have a number of tools in place, things like that to verify the network. But um, then what we're trying to do now is take that a step further and try to verify that data transfer performance has also increased uh, in addition to network tuning. So, um, get my mouse on here and click. Oops. So some of the background behind this is um, <clears throat> we're trying to find other ways to tools and collaborate um, related to uh, different data sources of data analysis related to what how networks interconnect um, both. Um, people as well as research instruments as well as um, uh, other sensors and things like that out there so a lot of times we get connectivity but then performance is often overlooked and that's where personar stepped in to initially um, you know kind of make sure the network's tuned properly and things like that but um, as instruments and cameras and images and multiple sensors are increasing like this uh, the network um, has become more and more uh, taxed with a lot of this transfer between sites so our goal with a lot of this is to make sure that at least on a 10 gig connected node that we can transfer at least one terabyte per hour as a minimum. So that's kind of our baseline goal for taking this pro program uh, to make sure that universities can transfer at these speeds. So um, one question due to the baseline is how, how often, how long does it take you to transfer a terabyte right now? So just something to keep in mind and maybe look at some of your data and things like that. But our goal is to try to make sure we can meet that. So we've all seen the science DMZ abstract, um, kind of looking at the, how the science DMZ is set up to, um, as an architecture and uh, design pattern to make sure we can transfer data more efficiently on uh, the CC star and the NSF program has really uh, scaled it out over, over a number of years to make sure that we can uh, have that capability. Many people have modified this in different ways to suit um, you know, their data architecture needs or um, different policies around security appliances, things like that, data transfer nodes, um, but again, it's just a design pattern to go from there. Um, with a lot of this, uh, the key component here is missing is you know, the, the validation of the data transfer. And that's something that this program is trying to implement. So you put the science DMZ in place, you have persona testing, and, um, but once again, you need to go back and validate your data transfer speeds. So as you look into this, um, a number of the uh, um, pieces that kind of go into the improvement steps with this, um, look into, you know, the some of the steps when you're looking at the grants and things like that, um, you're identified of a poor performance or you want to increase, uh, you see large flows if you're looking at your flow data or someone's really complaining about this. So this, these are just kind of some of the steps you'd step through and setting up your science DMZ, uh, you do some network tuning at your border, you know, has, has your science improved? Maybe, maybe not. Um, if you're looking at some of the flow data, maybe uh, if you're really engaged with the researchers, you know, you might get direct feedback on that. Um, but again, this is uh, what we're trying to do is have a framework to be able to validate that. So as you start out, you're looking at this pattern, um, you may have a researcher complaining. This is a simple little kind of cartoon you just step through here, uh, some of the workflow behind some of this. Um, you see someone's transferring 500 megabytes per second or 200 gigs an hour of science. So we know that should be better than that. Um, so you can validate, you put in your science DMZ, you put a person on our board, um, at the border, you're still only getting one, uh, one gigabit per second of per sonar, but that's almost double what you're getting on your campus land. So if you step into there, you do some other tuning, you bump that per sonar transfer up to get eight gigs a second. Um, so you know you've done some kind of wide area transfers in, in, to improve the speeds there. Um, you've actually installed your science DMZ and you replicate the same speed there for the network transfer. Um, and then as you step in from there, you actually put your DTN on in the science DMZ, and then you're still getting roughly, you know, different throughput there. So that's what, you, again, what we're, the overall goal for all this is. So as you look into testing to a DME DTN, these are well-tuned, um, um, known 
uh, end sort end endpoints that are tuned and, and can validate transfers appropriately. And so there's roughly uh, 10 terabytes of different data sets that are out there related to this, many files, many folders. We'll touch on that a little bit later. So you've already validated this with Perfsonar. So going a step further, you're trying to validate it against the DTN. And when you get into some of these transfers, you kind of see what your throughput you, uh, turns into when you actually test the transfer. And then if you start looking to tune the DTNs, which George is going to step on a little, start talking a little bit later, um, you kind of step through a number of procedures to try to get this fixed. And then you re replicate the same thing from this uh, DME DTN, you validate the fix, and now you're getting you know, much better throughput um, based on the fixes you're getting. So these are just kind of how you work through this. You know, and does, doesn't all, it shouldn't all stop with personal testing. We should try to do a step further, and that's what this program is for. So again, the increase there is 1.2 terabytes an hour of science. So some of the other pieces that get into this, um, some of the other tools to try to troubleshoot this, uh, in addition to the DTN tuning, um, are people still mailing hard drives? Are they reporting that it's slow? Um, do researchers know what their expectations should be? Uh, so, so through different engagement channels, some of those questions you can ask and understand there. Again, what, are, what is IT's um, uh, or the research IT's expectations of data transfer? What should we be expecting with some of these tools and uh, data architectures, data transfer nodes, things like that should we get? Um, one way to look into this is um, the NetSage portal has um, border, you can get top 10 source and destination reportings for this. So if you have this on your own campus or you're using your regional install, a net stage, you might be able to troubleshoot some of these and be able to have some visibility into what your transfers are doing. So this is from the faster data site. This is a um, kind of a, a table. You can kind of see where your transfers are at. And as we get through this, well, what we're trying to set up here for a 10 gigabit uh, data transfer node is a minimum of 2.2 gigabits per second, which is one terabyte per hour transfer speed. Um, they should be able to be tuned up to roughly uh, six and a half, uh, six, a little more than that um, on a DTN. But again, our minimum baseline uh, is the 2.2 gigabits per second or one terabyte per hour. So next steps, um, getting into the science DMZ and what we're doing there, some of these pieces come into play with uh, different uh, patterns of a data transfer, uh, like a different data portal, a uh, different data analysis, then it really depends how the researchers are setting up and how they're collaborating with their data. Uh, if it's bulk data movement, if it's more of a portal where uh, collaborators will go out and download different data sets, um, all these different things come into play when you're looking at designing these data architectures and validating data transfers. So a few years ago, the Petascale DTN uh, was measured across a number of the um, HPC sites around the country. And some of the data transfer nodes um, started from this. So the data, the DME is really just a um, the same replication of what happened at the Petascale DTN model a few years ago, uh, really to try to focus on increasing the edge speeds, the data transfer speeds and knowledge um, at the university level. So you step through here, you kind of see this is a before and after of you know how the testing started, what the speeds they were getting, and then the speeds afterwards once they were focused on and data transfers and some tuning was done. Uh, recently, we had a decent data transfer that um, really was kind of like <laughs> we looked at some of the stuff on our traffic portals and things like that, and we were kind of blown away by the, the, the amount of data that was transferred because some of this work happened ahead of time. So, again, if you do a little work and, and go a little further than just per sonar, uh, you, sh you should really see increases in data transfer performance on your campus. So as you scale into this, you know, what the program started off into was really just saying that, you know, not only do you need to have some technical improvements and things made, but also there's an opportunity to engage researchers at this point to both educate them on the data transfer uh, expectations they should have, what tools they're using, um, where they think they are, what, how they're possibly connected at their edge. There's a lot of opportunities for engagement um, with, with relating some of this data. Um, both from the understanding of what the technology can do or where they should be, but also possibly how they're set up and where you could have find improvements uh, within their instruments and within their infrastructure uh, for their research workflow. So again, um, like I said, this DME program was built based on the Petascale DTN project. Um, it was able to transfer one petabyte of data within a week. Um, we'll have some other charts here in a second uh, to be able to look at this. Um, anyone's really encouraged to uh, be added into the group and then be able to do transfers to validate your, 
data transfer speeds on your campus or within your lab or you know any whatever particular infrastructure you're looking at. Uh, the base, it really works by uploading and download a variety of data sets. Uh, we'd like to measure and baseline against the one terabyte per hour transfer rate uh, to see what kind of what, um, make sure you're validating at least at, against that minimum so we can do some improvements from there. And then, you know, we also will talk about what, what improvements we can make through that, so. The current locations of the DME endpoints, uh, there's one in uh, New York at Cornell, there's one at um, NCAR, Colorado, and there's one at uh, Argonne at Na National Lab there. There's also a few uh, DME cloud connectors for Google Drive and Box. Uh, and then we, ESNet has some 40 and 100 gig nodes. Um, we're in the model of um, ESNet's upgrade. Uh, so we're repurposing some of those nodes uh, to a few locations. We have a a number of other uh, nodes we're looking at, but we're running into some supply and logistical issues in getting those ordered and delivered. So um, we'll, we'll have two nodes uh, deployed shortly uh, to be able to add it into this as well. Uh, the different data sets, this is just a quick slide on what the data sets represent. Um, you know, the variety of sizes on the second column and then the breakdown in the third column of really what they are, the number of files, number of folders, things like that. So you can really get a variety depending on the data profile with the research workflow you're working with it could match up to something like this or um, there could be other um, variability within the data sets you're consistently testing but these are kind of baseline data sets to run from um, to kind of validate your uh, transfers so with some of the data so far um, we kind of drew the first year was kind of a discovery year uh, we looked at some of the data sets the second year we kind of i put these uh, horizontal lines in there based on the one terabyte per hour baseline and also the petascale number and the three large um, graphs there uh, are really the dme endpoints testing between one another and then you can kind of see where everything else is in relation to that so there are some sites meeting the one terabyte per hour baseline and then some other sites that are not um, so again, we're trying to look to improve those through um, reaching out and also doing further engagement this year uh, to try to see what we can do to get some of these other sites improved. Um, these are unique sources by university. And then this is the uh, in the reverse direction. So uploading the data. Um, so again, you can kind of see what these baseline numbers are. Stepping into that, here's kind of a scorecard we're working on. I think we have a Kind of revamping this a little bit but um we're really trying to see related to petascale or what we're doing this idea of the one terabyte per hour transfer um and getting into these speeds that's really based on the data volume but as part of this scorecard we're looking to to do it based on audience so if you're a researcher you understand your data volume to be transferred as a network technician uh, network engineer um we have a another scale based on the data you're typically used to seeing in gigabytes per gigabits per second and then the storage transfer rate from a sysadmin or a storage admin on um, those kind of transfer rates. So this is kind of the column we're focusing on to make sure people are meeting these uh, transfer speeds. But again, for the researcher and the overall goal and the, the outcome we want is based on the data volume we're able to transfer, not necessarily stressing the network or stressing the storage array, but we want to see this number here as a minimum. A few of the other pieces, uh, some links included in the slides, we'll be able to do that um, with the DME program, some testing, and there's also some automated testing features available on GitHub. Um, as part of this, Epic has included uh, the DME uh, to try to uh, look at some of the roadside assistance pieces to see what we can do to improve uh, data transfer speeds uh, in addition to some network tuning. So um, the programs have been added in here. And so these are a few links um, related to both NetSage and Epic that you can get into um, for looking at the DME as a program within that. We also have the ability, if you want to um, get your data transfer nodes connected into the science registry, there's a piece here where you can get your science DMZ or your, uh, data transfer node uh, added into the science registry as well. So next steps from there, you know, we want to see what participation we can uh, increase on that. Um, also look at the science DMZ design pattern. Um, there's other pieces within that that could be available to uh, data architectures and other pieces related in the rest of the slide deck. There's a few other examples of data architecture with um, both legacy portal and modern portal designs. There's also a quad chart at the end of the slide deck, but uh, I'll step out now and hand it off to George. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, sharing your Friday with us.
Uh, let me get my desktop shared out and hopefully everybody can see this okay. If not, scream in the chat or uh, interrupt me and we'll go from there. Um, the data uh, mobility exposition. Uh, I figured let's get back to some fundamentals and do some elementary network tuning today. So I'm gonna attempt to do a live demo and we're gonna try and quote unquote, drop the clutch. Let's see what we can do. So I'll kick it off with a few slides. Um, let's scope this. Uh, scoping it to Linux network performance tuning of older hardware. We all have researchers that have that instrument or that node or that old crusty DTN. And with supply chains being what they are, sometimes it's not gonna be a while before we get a chance to actually get that new shiny hardware. So let's see, use what we got. This is stuff that can be done at home. This can be stuff that can be done in your test lab. And the thought being is give uh, the tools that you can use here and now to make good changes and impact and improve the network. So again, older hardware, minor changes. We're not gonna make bricks today, hopefully. If not, um, we might have an end of carrier and an early end. Uh, and then we're gonna measure some of the real results and see what we can do. So with that, we're gonna start with some bespoke tuning. And I, I put two car pictures just kind of show you, right? Either it's a, a little tiny minimum uh, car or it's a highly tweaked hot rod. It depends on what you're trying to tune. And all that comes back to um, know what you're trying to do, know what results are reasonable. We're gonna measure, we're gonna go course to fine tuning. Uh, one change at a time is always good. Uh, let's divide the problem for what's next and reset and do it again and always measure. Mentions of net stage, mentions of persona. There's so many tools out there that we have at our disposal. I mean, it's, it's a candy land of data. Um, and then again, share. If, if you blow up tracks all over the, or blow up parts and they get all over the tracks, show it. I mean, sometimes we need to know the bad along with the good. Basically, the performance improvement didn't happen if you didn't document or share it. The trends. Um, again, raw data is okay. Look back at it, look back at it and refine it later. Um, command line logging. This is a two real quick and dirty commands that help if you're just trying to get what is it? What are we doing? I set up an automated test. Let's dump it to a log. Logs can help a ton. Um, easily scriptable and insanely low effort. It's just an operator or a pipe. Uh, what do we think this is going to do? That Keep that in the back of your mind. Sometimes things don't exactly hit the way you expect them, especially when you start getting further out on that path. Again, on the scoping of this, we're in a small test lab. When you start getting past that 10 millisecond, um, things get different. Um, trends, bad results can be good. You can learn a lot about failure modes. You can learn about uh, DAC versus uh, uh, optics. You can learn a lot about what pops and why. Uh, just make sure that why is answered. Again, course adjustments. I always like using a uh, 20 pound course adjustment hammer versus a uh, fine tuning uh, C-clamp in the lower left or lower right corner there. Those C-clamps don't work really good for holding heavy things, but man, you can measure down to a micrometer. Uh, one change at a time. Let's make it easy, right? So 80-20 rule. Let's get an 80% win. For four unknowns, you need four equations. Let's not do multi-equation mathematics here. Let's stick with one equation. Let's keep it simple. And then are the measurement results reasonable? So are we hitting our DME target? Can we, with an ancient piece of hardware, actually fit within that DME environment? Can we hit that one terabyte per hour? One change at a time, and the suggested scope again is, let's get an older piece of hardware into fight and shape. So course defined adjustments. I'm gonna start out with patches and upgrades. You can never have a bad day with a secure, well-tuned patch system. That's the course's adjustment, I can say. Drop your latest uh, OS updates and security patches. You're already doing good. Your path, know what's out there. Um, I think we'd all be millionaires if uh, we had a nickel for every time it was the MTU. Also, buffers. The buffers can be a, a massive problem. If you don't know your path and what's in the way, those buffers are going to bite. 
we're getting finer resolution as we go down here. Now we're diving into things like congestion control and kernel parameters, right? BDR, can't say enough good about it. It has made a really impressive splash. Uh, BDR by default is almost for free on Debian and Ubuntu-based systems. Um, uh, BVR v2 is just around the horn, if not mistaken. There's some amazing research on that. I believe there's been some talks on this on this channel. Uh, uh, please check those out. Uh, now we're getting even further down. We're given more allocations of the memory and buffers. Now we're getting into like Q length. Um, how much are we able to ingest and inhale and exhale? And then finally down into the, the, the weeds where we're starting to go into ring buffers. Patches and update, again, Systems that are well patched and update tend to purr. Don't forget that firmware. You know, if you're running on a really well patched system, but you're still running on a buggy um, BIOS or a buggy NIC, there's a lot of fixes that come along. Um, the updated modules, something as simple as a newer kernel, uh, BBR versus Reno. In the example we have today, these are older systems. These are uh, uh, Cent 7. Uh, so we'll see a little bit of difference there. Um, collaboration also. It's trivial to collaborate when all you have to do is drop an ISO in or rebuild from scratch and reproduce the results. Um, it, it makes it very easy to share. No, uh, I touched on knowing your path. And again, the DMZ is fantastic. Um, the science DMZ we all know and love. Where are you going? Are you sticking in the rack? Are you going on your LAN? Are you going on your WAN? You're going further. There's a lot to scope in there. Um, what's in the way? Start again thinking that 80 20 rule. And I'm going to put a shameless plug in. Can Epic help? We have roadside assistance. So I'm going to go into ring buffers and we're really close to the demo. So um, ring buffers, uh, using ETH tool, the dash G and K I'm going to use in this particular demo. And why in the heck would we mess, them, uh, mess with them? We're going to make the NIC work for us. We're going to turn off extras and we're going to try and turn on performance. So ring buffers, let's look at the G flag. Uh, have your interrupt ready to work with a good queue, right? So the syntax is something where I want to take a look. It's little G. I want to do large G. Um, in the right hand there, I gave a little example of what it looks like. And this is this is TARS. This is my workstation. You notice that TARS is highly untuned. Uh, the current hardware has a small RX and a TX, and the maximums are there. That said, sometimes setting the maximums out of the gate isn't a good thing. Ring buffers again, the K and the large K. K look, large K do. Uh, I kind of liken this one to the transmission, right? It's let's turn off extras that are trying to happen on a network uh, card. There are times where other operating systems get tremendous performance increases for things like um, the TOW, the TCP IP offload engine. That has been a game changer for certain OSs. Why do we need that? Um, are there times where you need large receive offload in silicon versus what your kernel is already doing fantastically? Let's turn it off um, or turn it on, bending on your results and your path. So again, the little K, let's read the configs, the big K, let's do it. I wanted to give everybody a little toy. Um, this is kind of a takeaway, I guess you could say. And this goes to the pattern of let's not break bricks, do no harm, change one thing at a time. This script, we try going through, and again, everything's via syscontrol W. So it writes, but isn't persistent. We're not putting this into the OS config files to load at boot. So with this toy in your test lab, you can execute components of this or play with some of these components. Some of them will fail. Uh, there's things here where you need to change to your network card. Um, there's some operating systems that may not have BBR support. Um, this one is known to work on Debian 10 and Debian 11 and should work also on Ubuntu. Uh, I have not built one for Rocky quite yet or one for Cent quite yet. But the thought being is take this and have some fun with it. Uh, you can brick your own system with this and reboot safely. Uh, it's a nice way to see what your tuning will do, be able to back off and come back forward. 
Okay. So before so you uh, oh, go yeah, on go there, ahead. George, there, there's a question that came in. Oh, um, fantastic. Thanks for the question. Let's see here. Is I, it the community? Actually, oh, go ahead. I, I'll read it just for the, the sake of the, uh, <clears throat> the recording. Is the community's advice to enable BBR for large scale data transfers? I thought many in the community were still worried about the fairness issues of BBR1 and were waiting for BBR2 to solidify uh, and to be tested and vetted. I'm not sure that you and, and Ken will be able to answer that one, but you know, I'll just leave it out there in case you have some, some thoughts. That's an excellent question. I don't have a definitive or authoritative answer. I'll take it back to the component of know your path. If you are doing no harm on the path, and it's making the performance hit, and it's well known what your experiment has done, and every responsible engineer along that path is okay, I see no harm. That said, be careful. I mean, don't blast across, don't be a packet cannon. Um, so um, I, that, that would be the only thought pattern I'd apply to that. Um, Ken, did you have any feedback? No, I know there's some, been some other testing done that, um... I think there should be a paper coming out and some other things like this related to some of this, but um, yeah, I'm not sure about, you know, what um, community advice would be. <laughs> we can follow up with that. That's a fantastic question, by the way. And that's the proper mindset too. Um, the last thing we'd want to do is turn an entire data center on that is a potential feature that could do harm versus help. Um, like literally on the screen, let's not make bricks. Um, Again, back to the script that I was sharing, um, do no harm, allow for a reboot to reset the problem, be able to reset their problem, track changes and solidify with the automation. And then overall, did it improve? So in theory, I'm gonna try a live demo. Worst case scenario, this is gonna look like that and it'll be embarrassing. We'll have a good story to tell. So I'm gonna switch over to terminal. And again, uh, we're going to try out um, two identical servers. And this is my workstation. And we're going to find out, well, first off, what do we got? Would this be a DME class node? And can we make it better? So this one is 627. Let's see what 627 has to say. And I'm going to dumpster. Uh, my local area network is called Cupcake. Uh, my daughter named it. And dumpster happens to be just a Dumpster, that's my local NAS. Um, I'm hitting okay speeds here. Uh, this is a 10 gig NIC. Um, I think that would fit within the six gigabits per second range. And this is using a tool that we all know and love, iPerf3. This is part of the Perf Sonar suite. I've taken this out of Perf Sonar and I'm trying to do this via sysadmin, right? This is a single install, let's rock and roll. So that looks okay. Let's use that exact same command and let's take it over to this uh, 62e and see what we got and it's pre-baked so we still fit but these are identical hardware right so what do we got going on why can't why can't these two identical pieces of hardware do the same right um they've got similar memory Um, cat proc. They look like they're Xeons, so cat proc CPFO. I mean, that looks identical to me, um, but we have different performance parameters. So, IP link show in S1. Let's take a look. IP link show in S1. Hmm. Check that out. Something simple, but let's not do MTU first, right? Let's see what we got. So uh, let's go for this after a change, right? So let's get a baseline. And let's also let it run again. So we have a baseline. So we're going to go, okay, pre-change. And it should pop up here in a moment. Cool, we got it. Let's verify our baseline is here. It is, and it has our date. So let's make sure, uh, let's echo out, change, uh, let's change ring. 
and let's dump that out to baseline. And let's also do date one more time. Okay, so now let's go change those ring buffers. So what are we gonna do? Let's play with the ETH, ETH, uh, ETH tool, G, ENS1, and let's see what we got. So these are a little low. Let's play with those. And big G is change. And I would like to change the TX to 8192 and RX to 8192. What's that do? Takes a moment. This is where we wonder if we make a brick. Because we're changing the buffers, it has to reinitialize. There's a lot that's happening in the back end. And we got a terminal back, so we don't have a brick. Okay, so what did we do? Did we change anything? Let's find out. And we'll cat that file out one more time. And when this run happens, well, out of the gates, 659 still fits, but that doesn't seem better. But I'm not sure. I don't remember the previous one. So we can always cat back to our uh, baseline and we can find out. So we made it worse. Check that out. But is that good or is that bad? We don't know, right? So let's play again. And let's take a look at the K. Right? And also on purpose, what I've done here is I've gone to a high resolution tuning versus a broad stroke to do this improperly, showing that you know we're kind of going backwards, but that's interesting. So GRO is on, GSO is on. Let's turn those off. Okay, and I don't know if this is gonna make any betters, but let's find out. Um, so let's uh, echo test dash K ring to our baseline. And let's find out what we did. And one of the parts that I'm attempting to show here is that if you have a fundamental path problem, tuning a system doesn't always help solve or alleviate. So you need to collaborate. Um, so that's eight, six. I, again, don't remember the number. So we have our log and there's our eight, six, five, nine. So we made it better. And our original was eight, two. So we took it from eight, two to eight, six. That's, that's not that cool. So I'm gonna cheat and fix our root cause issue. We're going to fix the path now. And this is another case where we could potentially brick the system. OK, so let's uh, let's echo out what we're doing. MTU is repaired. Repair. I probably misspelled that. And let's fire it off. And let's see if we got 8.6 any better. I kind of have a feeling it will be. Whoa, 9.9. Nine. Yeah, hey, that's a lot better. OK, so now we have a, a, a log of what we tuned. We have the results before, the results after. We have the original system, which again, I didn't log this one, but we can always go back to the system that's behaving. So this is 627 versus 62E. So 62E, 627's doing pretty good. It looks like we're up to speed. And then just for a comparison of a lightly tuned out of box system, we could do the same thing. Uh, and I was going to dumpster. Oops, ah, hey, iperf is the legacy version. And this is a lightly tuned system. I use this as a daily driver. Um, so it's, it's I, I haven't gotten into ring buffers or anything like that. So that's kind of an out of box versus out of box modern system versus an older system. Uh, if there's, and let me go back to the slides for a second. So we luckily didn't cause this to happen quite yet. Um, 
the details here. We lightly tuned a network interface, right? We were messing around with the ring buffers. Ring buffers start getting down into that fine resolution, right? We weren't seeing the large numbers move. We were in the wrong spot. We wanted to be in the 80 section, not the 20 section, right? So I was using a, a, a fine adjustment hammer versus a nice 20 pound sledge. Sometimes the simple solutions and the low hanging fruit are really worth it. Um, if you can validate your path has MTU all the way through, rock on, let's go. Um, these were two identical and older systems by design, right? I wanted to show for all those folks with older hardware out in the land and with supply chains being what they are, you can tune older systems sometimes. Uh, I'm going to put an asterisk on that. I will never encourage out of warranty hardware to be used in production. That just makes part replacement and sysadmin lives horrible. Um, these two boxes are HP DL160 Gen 8s. Um, they had an end of service life in January 3rd, 2015, and we're still able to hit the DME target. Uh, the network interface cards, um, they're ConnectX old. They're the 10 gig ConnectXs. I think they're ConnectX 2s. Uh, and then again, CPU and then the network itself was just test lab class. It's a, it's a uh, uh, MicroTik, just a little 10 gig interface. So here's a few command line issued from the demo that I want to share. Um, IP link show, IPerf S, IPerf 3, the target. Um, and then your ring buffer play. Uh, and the key to this one was our MTU. So with that, thank you a ton for letting me uh, present and I'll, I'm happy to do any questions and uh, hand the floor back. All right, well, thanks George for, for going through all of that in such detail and perfect example of how little changes can make a, a big difference. And most people probably already have capable hardware. It's just a matter of sitting down and figuring out which uh, individual pieces you need to tweak to get to that level. Yes. Um, so thanks again for that. Ken drop the links to the, the data mobility program in the chat right now. Um, so I'll put out the general call for questions here. And I have a couple that I can seed the, the conversation with. So this is one for Ken. Uh, I think you, you showed the graph, but it maybe even if you want to show it again, what, what's sort of the baseline performance that we're seeing across the community right now if we remove some of the quote unquote high performers, what level are people currently at? Um, the current data sets um, ranging anywhere from a few hundred megs up to you know a gig, gig and a half. It just depends um, on some of the nodes. Um, we're looking to clean up some of the log data because some people are testing with laptops and things like that. So um, we're skewing some of that out. Um, but typically, it's been you know a little under a gig to a little over a gig for most sites. Um, some sites are pretty well tuned. Um, and I think one site was getting as high as 25 gigs on a, from an HPC cluster and somewhere in the Midwest, I think somewhere on GPN, but um, I'm trying to see what the other slides were here. Um, yeah, I think we determined that was at uh, Kansas State. Uh, so good job, James, on, on pushing them to, to get moving on that one. Yeah, I think here's the data. So I guess I'll do a, a poll the audience while you're yeah. looking at more data there. Uh, those that are listening still, uh, have you tested? If you have, put your numbers in the chat. If you haven't, uh, shame on you. And certainly uh, try to try to follow the instructions that Ken sent because we've been running this for about two and a half years now and we need data. And the only way we can get data is if we harangue all of you on weekly calls to, to do it. So go ahead, Ken. Oh, just uh, looking at the two data sets here. Um, like I said, you'll see most well, sites are below the 2.2 um, on this red line here. So you'll see a number of things like that. You'll see a couple peak over that. Um, but again, this is just a general variety of pieces. Um, for the next year's data set, we're going to try to like do a little more fine tuning and uh, looking at the Globus logs to see, you know, what if they're a DTN on a site or a test DTN, possibly how they're labeled in the system to try to skew some of those out. Um, so try to get more, a little more accurate results. Um, and like I said, there are a few laptops in there and some of them are also testing the cloud sites, which kind of skew the numbers as well. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at, but let's see here. And Vass has a question. Vass, I'm just gonna make you a co-host so you can unmute yourself. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. So I just wanted to chime in on the on the endpoints that are available for that DME. So Ken and I talked about this earlier. We've had, we originally had a whole bunch of endpoints, including the Box and Google Drive that Ken had mentioned. Uh, over the two and a half or so years that we've been running, or it's been about two years since we've been running these, um, they've naturally sort of <laughs> uh, died away. Some of them have been refreshed with stored new storage systems and things haven't been carried over. So there's really only three endpoints right now that are, I would say ready and usable. Um, there's, there's the Cornell one, the Argon one, and the uh, NCAR or UCAR one. Um, but one of the things that um, I have teed up right after supercomputing is to reach out to sort of 20 or 30 large groups that we know have decent networks in place, uh, DMZ, uh, science DMZs, and ask if they will uh, stand up something a little more persistent on their Globus endpoint. So, Hopefully we'll get enough bytes from that. They will have a representative sample of more, more than three endpoints so that people can test against sort of real, real other end. Yeah. So just that just wanted to make uh, people aware of that. And if anybody on this call, by the way, wants to proactively offer up um, order 10 terabytes of space and uh, um, a shared endpoint, a shared Globus collection on their uh, endpoint, uh, please uh, reach out to me, Vass at uh, uchicago.edu. Thanks. All right, thanks, Vass. So we had a couple of questions get inserted in. Uh, Doug wants to know, do you have an idea of how much follow-up there is after the initial DME test? For instance, if you have a site test, you typically see follow-up testing with different results indicating that they've been tuning and retesting their infrastructure. Um, yeah, we have a few sites that have uh, tested routinely, and I think there's a question about the automated testing. Um, I'll share that uh, the link as well. Um, a few of the sites have done some increases um, uh, on one of the, I think they made a few changes and I think they got a different ISP. Um, we're trying to get that case study developed and try to do a little more follow-up. Uh, we also have a follow-up request into some of the automated testing that was completed. Um, again, those numbers are pretty consistent because of the automation pieces, and we're trying to see what um, and pro, like profile that data architecture as, as well as profile what they were testing and what they're trying to automate. And if they were making a series of changes or if the automation was just kicked off and just let run. Um, those are the two instances right now. Um, but starting uh, this year, we're also following up on each individual testing node uh, to see if there's any uh, further engagement uh, and any other improvement we want to do directly to uh, be a little more specific and try to get more clear results and possibly profiling other data architectures or other DTNs for folks to have as a comparison, so. All right. And just a comment here, uh, James was saying, uh, VAS may have a set of scripts to make some of the testing simpler to, to iterate across that, which I think is true. We may even yeah, link just, to that on the web page, but if not, we can pull it I just posted it in chat as well. Yeah. I I will caution that those have probably also atrophied the last uh, number of months. So I, I now that now that I've been reminded, I will put that on my next on the to-do list. Thank you. You know, if we didn't have public callouts, all of our stuff would atrophy. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. And. Thanks for the demo, George. Went through nearly identical process last week and saw DTN go from 100 megabit range to 7 gig range, disk to disk. So, yep, there's the, the power of positive suggestion right there. Yeah, um, and then, yes, striking the dead DTNs is recommended. Okay. Well, I'll put out one last call here in case anybody has any other questions or wants to take Michael's bait of talking about the BBR thing. Um, thanks again to our speakers. Uh, for a change, we're not going to have a talk for the next two weeks, I think, because of the holiday break. Yep, that's correct. So we'll pick up again in December uh, with Brenna Mead talking about the SC21 WAN configuration. And as Ken noted in the chat there, yep, Epic is available to help as well. So I think I'll end us for, for this week. Uh, thanks again to the speakers. We'll make sure we get the video uh, uploaded and posted and hope everybody has a, a good weekend and a good holiday. And we'll talk to everybody again in December. Thanks all. Thanks.